Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz saxophonist, composer, band leader, and educator, Greg Tardy. His newest 2020 CD out on September 18th is called If Time Could Stand Still. Kind of feels like things have happened that way here in pandemic world. It was done with some great artists, Alex Norris, Keith Brown, Alex Claff, and Willie Jones III. It is a very impassioned recording that reflects on the changing seasons of life and surges with his love of swing and tradition. He was born in New Orleans, and all of that comes out with the influences that he's always dug, like Elvin Jones, Andrew Hill, Tom Harrell, Bill Frizzell, and so many others. His story and devotion is one you need to hear. Enjoy. Well, Greg, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz, man. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. So let's start off here. You know, we're talking about time and things along those lines. Your newest album, If Time Could Stand Still. Talk to me a little bit about releasing an album during a pandemic. I'm very thankful that, um, I mean, the, the, the CD was actually originally going to be released in March, um, and that got pushed back because of COVID, but I'm really happy that we had this one in the can during this time, you know, partially because, uh, you know, so that people can remember that I'm here <laughs> since I'm not outperforming, but also yeah. because I just, we, I just really feel that the, the world needs music right now. I'm a little disappointed that I can't really tour this CD, at least not now. Um, I can't really uh, book any gigs around it, but, um, but hopefully this thing will be over um, sooner rather than later, and then I can uh, get out there and and um, be able to generate something with it. So I guess that's my next question about this album. You know, when the listener buys this album or downloads it, goes to the experience. What do you want them to get from this new artistic endeavor of yours? Well, that's uh, that's a good question. What I want them to get from it, I, I think that. Um, when I made this CD, I, um, I guess I'll talk about the vision behind it. It's, I had, um, you know, I had some great musicians on the project, Keith Brown on piano, Alex Claffey on the bass, Alex Norris on the trumpet. They're all phenomenal musicians. But this project was mostly wrapped around, uh, the, you know, the great Willie Jones, who produced the, the, the project and played drums on it. Um, we've known each other for many, many years. And um, we played together. I played on... Two or three of his projects we played on other people's projects and and this was uh when he um basically approached me about doing this, I was really um happy uh because it I knew it would give us an opportunity to uh, uh to hear him on my music and so a lot of the music I wrote was uh centered around him uh, around uh, around some of his uh you know great strengths and his impeccable groove. And um, it's a bit of a departure from some of the more modern stuff I've done over the last 15 years or so. But um, but um, but that's actually a good thing because I've done so much modern stuff over the, um, the last 20 years that sometimes I wonder if people even realize that my focus when I'm working at home is predominantly on the tradition. Um, when I'm practicing at home, I'm checking out Sonny Rollins, I'm checking out Train, I'm checking out Ben Webster, I'm checking out... Um, you know, Coleman Hawkins, I'm checking out Sonny Stitt and all of them. And, um, you know, whether I was, you know, playing some, um, whether I was playing with uh, some more open stuff with Dave Douglas or with Andrew Hill or um, or whether I was playing some more um, Latin jazz, whatever it is, um, my focus when I'm at home is more the tradition. And so I wanted that to come out. Um, I definitely wanted that to come out. If that if that makes any sense, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. And speaking of tradition, that that makes sense that that's a part of your DNA. You're from New Orleans, so oh yeah, talk to oh, me yeah. A, yeah, you know. I mean, and and I feel that because of Kansas City and the and the lore and the history being one of the original cradles of this art form. So my question to you is this: uh, What was your childhood like? How did you get indoctrinated into not only music but jazz? I'll try to shorten a very long story. Um, I come from a musical family. My parents were both opera singers. And um, so I was around classical music a lot. My brother and my sister both played. Uh, my brother played trumpet. My sister played flute. And um, and so it was just something that was always in the house. And we moved around a lot of different places. And um, one of the places we lived for uh, my high school and um, many of my college years was uh, around the Milwaukee area. 
And um, during that time, I started dabbling in, uh, I was a classical clarinetist, uh, essentially, and I started dabbling in the saxophone. And uh, even though I didn't play the saxophone very well, I started getting calls for gigs. Um, my first gig was a polka band, and after that, <laughs> believe it or not, and then after that, then I started uh, playing in some jazz fusion bands, um, a band called The Crew, and then another band called Cooler Near the Lake. And it's... Uh, and right around that time, uh, my brother introduced me to the music of Thelonious Monk and John Coltrane, and that just completely changed my world. And my mom, who also um, at that point, uh, although I wasn't really following him much, she was a, a jazz, she had changed to jazz by that point, and she had a pretty good jazz collection. I found Sonny Stitt in her jazz collection, and and some Sonny Rollins, and then uh, I started going to the library and checking out a whole bunch of other people, and and the next thing you know, I was I was in it. I never intended to leave classical music or the clarinet, but it just kind of happened, and uh, so that's that's uh, you know. Then after that, I moved back to to make a long story short, I moved back to New Orleans for a while um, to get my stuff together. Then I moved um, to New York, and now I'm in. Knoxville, Tennessee. So that's kind of my story, uh, abbreviated. <laughs> what was one of the first live jazz shows you ever saw that made you think, man, this is something I want to do? There's a, a, a club in, um, in Milwaukee called the Jazz Oasis, or there was, I don't know if it's still there. I know the Jazz Estate is still there, but there was a, a club called the Jazz Oasis. And there, there was, a um, when I first started dabbling in jazz i went there to hear some music and there was a there was a, a saxophonist there named um charles davis jr not uh not the one that everyone knows but there, he's a tenor player a very very good tenor player kind of coming out of sunny rollins and then there's a trumpeter named neil shundek uh, who uh, who i'm happy to say i'm still in touch with and so I, I saw a gig that they were doing and it um and that was the first time that i really thought wow you know I like to, you know, I like to do what they're doing. You know, I like, you know, I, I felt that like, you know, I felt that like, uh, I felt that it was drawing me. And, uh, and I felt like I could, uh, you know, like maybe I, maybe I should do this. Maybe I could do this, you know? And I know that, um, I was a little bit apprehensive at first. Um, but it was actually when I saw, um, I saw some, uh, on, on TV, saw, uh, some performances of, uh, from Wynton Marsalis, and my mother had a Wynton Marsalis record, and I really, really loved where he was coming from, and that that also kind of spurred me on. What have you learned from, like, veterans and from those that are very steeped in the traditions of jazz over your years that have helped you? What have you taken from them that you, in turn, give to younger players that play with you? That's another one that it's kind of hard to give a short answer to, but I had... Um, there are some local musicians that are uh, very, very celebrated local musicians in Milwaukee and in St. Louis, where I live for a minute, as well as New Orleans, who um, um, people that uh, names like Berkeley Fudge and Manti Alexander, uh, Manti Ellis, sorry, and St. Louis Willie Akins and and uh, some other people, where I learned a lot from um, checking them out and uh, just just learning a little bit more about. The standard, and and also and also um, I learned a lot about uh, bebop from these players. I learned a little bit more about the other aspects of the tradition when I was in New Orleans and I was around Ellis Marsalis. I forgot to mention David Hazeltine. He's another one that I learned a lot from, uh, an awful lot from when I was in Milwaukee, and um, and then eventually I started playing with Elvin Jones, and um, he taught me a lot about. Uh, Playing with passion and 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 and, and, uh, and taught me a lot more about being professional. I played uh, with Andrew Hill, and he got me to start playing more free, uh, more open, and uh, and so that's something that was really invaluable to me. And uh, many others. I mean, there's just so so many. Uh, I mean, there's. I know uh, my time with Bill Frizzell, uh, oh, I, I still play with Bill. So many things I've learned from him about musicianship and, and uh, being able to uh, 
play off of a melody and, and having so many ways to play off of a melody. And this is a really real endless conversation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, let me, let me get back to something that's more centric, maybe a little easier to answer. You know, you've been at this for a while. And if you could, if you have a dream tonight and you run into yourself getting ready to go out to do your first gig or your first set of gigs, and you could give your younger self advice based on what you've seen through these years, what would be the advice you would give your younger self? Uh, well, the first thing I would tell myself, uh, my younger self, is to humble yourself because you're not as good as you thought, uh, as you think you are. <laughs> um, uh, because I was, uh, uh, it's kind of funny, back when I first started, I thought I was killing. Um, back in the, the early polka fusion days, I thought I was like the, best thing since sliced bread and and uh which is very embarrassing because there are recordings of me back in those days floating around and i definitely uh had a lot to learn um so i'd say this is just, just uh humble yourself and and get more advice i didn't ask enough uh questions when i was with elvin i didn't ask enough questions when i was at andrew hill I didn't ask enough questions when um i uh i did a lot of gigs with rashid ali and I didn't ask him enough questions. Um, I had, a, um, you know, I did a gig with Jay McShann and, and, and so, so many others. And I'm like, why, why did I not ask more questions? Because, I mean, part of it is I was very shy. Um, and I'd always be afraid of saying the wrong thing. But, but really, it's more important to get that information, even if you uh, make a fool out of yourself in the process asking a dumb questions. Just ask. Um, because uh, the older cats always want to pass it on to the to the younger people, and um, so that's what uh, so that's what I would tell myself. What do you like the best about being a musician? I like the freedom of expression. Um, when I was a classical musician, I uh, and, and I still love classical music very very much, and I and um, and I hope to actually start playing uh, more of it out again um but sometimes when i was just a classical musician i felt like i was in a bit of a box um because i had this uh this music within me that i wanted to bring out and i felt like i couldn't do it within the context of i didn't feel like i could express myself enough um which isn't it's not a diss on on classical music because there's a lot of there are a lot of uh, classical musicians who feel completely like they can um, they can express themselves within that. But for me, I felt that uh, I wanted to have more of a freedom of interpretation, and um, and uh, and so that's that's what I like the best about being a, a you know a so-called jazz musician. And then also I, I I feel that I just love the the privilege of being able to you know I mean a lot of this goes into my whole. Uh, how I feel about faith, because I, I feel that overall that God gives us all individual gifts. Um, I have mine, you have yours, and everyone has some kind of gift. And I think it's, I feel like it's our task to use those uh, giftings to uh, to bring glory back to him. And I feel it's a privilege that the gifting he gave me for this task is music. So when we do return to, you return to the stage and we return to the audience, what do you hope we all get from this absence of black music once this COVID curtain is, is gone? I hope that people will respect how necessary and essential the arts are. I hope that they, uh, they will financially support uh, the artists more. Um, for live music, you know, uh, so many times that, you know, playing on gigs where there's not enough people there to really uh, keep the club, um, keep the various venues uh, uh, comfortably, feeling comfortable. Be, uh, but, you know, um, I feel that people need to support uh, the music for live music and for people's uh, individual projects that they're trying to do, um, if that makes sense. And I, and I hope people will also have more respect for the spontaneity and energy of this music. Let me ask you this. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but you're living your life. Who do you think you are? Musically, I look at myself as being neither old school or new school. I've been accused of 
both. <laughs> I'd say like one of my students made a joke once and said, well, you're not old school or middle, uh, new school, so you must be middle school. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll take that. I'll call myself a middle school jazz musician because I love the tradition and I also love to reach forward. And so I really hope that uh, people will avoid trying to put me in either box. Um, as far as uh, who I am as a person, um, I look at myself as, uh, you know, as I said before, a, a follower follower of Jesus. I'm a, ver a very, very strong Christian. I consider myself to be a family man. Um, and I'd say that my, uh, you know, my... The bulk of my time is spent on learning, trying to continue to learn as much about music as I can, impart that to my students, um, writing music. I'm a composer. I I, uh, I want to be looked at as a serious composer. Greg, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. Good luck with the new album, and good luck with the return to uh, what I like to call the revival of music when it comes back. Yeah, amen, amen. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been a pleasure to uh, speak with you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in New Orleans, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Greg for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.